But it is my uh, great pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to George Mumford. And George is here joining us today uh, to talk about his book, which you can see right here, The Mindful Athlete. And some of you have a copy of in front of you. And he's here to share some of the, the wisdoms and, le and uh, wisdom and lessons in his book. But even more than that, to share some of who he is with all of you. And uh, one of the things that I was really struck by when, when reading George's book is what an extraordinary life you've had and the extent to which you've been listening your whole life. And it's that listening that really struck me, that you've been, uh, you know, you, you watched messages coming in. Sometimes you, you took the message right away. Other mm -hmm. times you let it sit for a couple of years. <laughs> um, and, but when you were ready, you went after it. And you really paid attention to what was around you, took from teachings from many, many people, and then found a calling around sharing those teachings and helping other people um, listen and learn for themselves. And your, um, your story is extraordinary. Your, your humility is just as extraordinary. <laughs> and we're just um, so lucky to have you here today to share some of your thoughts with us and experience. Um, some of you will know George by reputation for the work that he's done with professional basketball stars. If you're a basketball player, you know all the names, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, and so forth. If you aren't, doesn't matter, big basketball stars. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I think what's, what's, what's interesting about the work that you've done with professional athletes is that you have found people um, who happen to be at the top of their profession doing work that required them to be entirely present. And so they happen to be in athletics. I know you've done work with people in many other right. uh, walks of life, people who need to be the very best that they can be at the top of their game and helping them find a way to be that, but along the way, finding extraordinary peace. And so before I let George do some of the talking, I, I want to share, um, I want to read this to you because it's so special, something George just shared with me, um, which is his charter. And George's purpose for his life is to release the divine spark within every human being. And when I think about that in the context of the work that you're doing, it really is being there for people and finding the way to release that spark. And some of the values that shape his work are love, curiosity, truth, wisdom, selfless service, integrity, courage, and compassion. And what an extraordinary set of gifts to bring to the world around you. So uh, I'm Karen May. I lead our people development team. And it's my deep pleasure to introduce George to you today. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, your calling, and your book. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Well, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, being at Google, uh, very often I can't use my computer without uh, referring to Google in one way or the other. We or like least. that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so when when I when I agreed to come here and talk about my book, I, I, I actually gave them a little idea of what it is I wanted to talk about today. So this is a reminder to me as well: like the power of flow, the role of mindfulness in cultivating uh, flow readiness. So this idea, the interesting thing about flow, how many people know what, what the flow is, a zone, or the zone? OK, great. So a lot of people know that. And the interesting thing about flow or the zone is that if you try to get into flow, you won't. So it's one of these paradoxes. So I prefer to talk about the role of mindfulness and cultivating what I would call flow readiness. And so. So creating the conditions so flow will arise when it arises. And so being in flow or being in a zone of flow is enhanced by the regular practice of being mindful in all our activities in such a way that an emphasis is put on the continuity of mindfulness. This requires an expanded view of what mindfulness meditation is in the sense that sitting practice or being still and knowing is just one aspect of the practice. It is possible for us to be mindful from the time we wake up until the time we fall asleep. Just being mindful of our postures during the day as we are sitting 
walking, standing, and lying down. We can practice being fully open, fully engaged, and welcoming each unfolding unknown moment with mindfulness and wisdom. And I have to say, that's a mouthful, <laughs> what I just said. And the interesting thing is, so it would be obvious to talk about uh, what is mindfulness? How many people in here know what mindfulness is? How many people practice mindfulness and don't know what mindfulness is? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, my buddy John Kabat-Zinn talks about mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way in the moment, non-judgmentally, as if your life depended on it. Now, he doesn't use that all the time, but I like to use that because it's really important. But another way of thinking about mindfulness is that it's a, it's a way of being where we're able to observe experience. And one of the things I do in my book, I talk about uh, the space between stimulus and response. And Viktor Frankl uh, has a quote. I think, let's see if I can find it. I don't really need the quote. I can just talk about it. But basically, he's saying between the space of stimulus and response is our power and freedom to choose. Um, and that another way of looking at mindfulness, I have some things here that I want to read because it gives you an idea. So when I talk about mindfulness, I'm also talking about mindfulness that's supported by some qualities, which I call in the book the superpowers. And they have to do with this idea of faith or confidence. Because if you really think about it, in order to make an effort, we have to have enough faith or confidence to actually make that effort. And I know that, that trust or confidence is really important because Einstein said so. <laughs> Einstein basically said that, um, that the most important question we have to ask is whether the universe is friendly or unfriendly, or neither. And that, just to cut it short, because instead of going through all of them, I'll just talk about the idea that he said, if the universe is unfriendly, then we will use all of our resources, all our technology, to build bigger walls to actually keep out the danger or to actually get hostile and, and, and you know, kill off any, any threat. And if we think the universe is neither friendly or unfriendly, and that God is you know, just throwing, it's like throwing a pair of dice, it's the roll of the dice that determines whether the universe is friendly or not, then why bother with anything? There's no consequences to doing anything. But if the universe is friendly, and that the way forward is to use all our resources, our technology, to understand how the world is, to understand how the universe works, and to align our intentions and purposes with the way things work, then we're into something. And so that's the place that I'm coming from, and that on a really basic level, if, if we don't think the universe is friendly, then you know, why would we cultivate mindfulness? Why would we pay attention? Why would we try to figure out how things work? And so this idea of having this faith, and sometimes it's just a, a launching faith, just enough faith to try something, but on a deeper level is understanding that how we choose to think, feel, and behave has an impulse, has an impact, and that the universe is lawful and that the best way to live is to live in alignment with that. So having faith to actually make the effort. And so mindfulness is one thing, but then there's this faith that enhances us to make the effort. And you have to make the effort to be mindful. And so we talk about effort, or what I talk about in the book is diligence. And it's a way of looking at effort or energy as a continuous application of enthusiastic, poised energy. So oftentimes what I find working with people in my own practice for years until I woke up a little bit is that there's this efforting or just trying too hard or having this energy that's, that's really um, guided by greed or, or wanting it badly or trying too hard. And that energy doesn't work. And then there's the other energy that's lethargic or just not making any effort at all because you know, we don't think it matters. And so effort is similar to like tuning a guitar. If anyone plays a string instrument, 
when you tune a guitar, if it's too tight, it doesn't work. And if it's too loose, it doesn't work. It has to be balanced just right. And so when we make an effort, the idea is continuous uh, application of enthusiastic, uh, poised energy. Or the idea is when you're doing something, you, you know, it's, it's almost like uh, there's a Hokey Carmichael line in this song that says, slow motion gets you there faster. It's similar to that, that effort is just the application. No matter what, you just keep applying the effort. It doesn't matter what the results are. It's walk straight ahead no matter what. So the interesting thing about effort and the interesting thing about not making a wrong effort is that it has to be balanced by wisdom. And one way of looking at wisdom is information, uh, intellect or rational thinking, which we call wise reflection, reflecting on things using our intelligence. And the third way is what we call uh, intuition or direct experience. And so the idea is when we experience it subjectively, that's the deepest uh, way of knowing or intuition. So information, uh, intelligence, and direct experience. And so wisdom, what mindfulness does is it balances effort, but effort is balanced by, uh, uh, let me go back before that. Um, so, so the um, wisdom balances the faith. So going back to faith, because I talked about faith and, and effort, but they have to be balanced by mindfulness. So mindfulness cultivates faith, but it also cultivates wisdom, because if you have too much faith and no discernment, then it's blind faith. So, and it's the same thing with wisdom. If you're too wise or too intelligent, then you become cynical. And so the idea of mindfulness cultivates these things individually, effort, um, trust, um, wisdom. It cultivates those things, but then it also balances them. And so wisdom balances faith, and then concentration, or what I like to use, steadiness of mind, is what balances effort. When I talked about a poised effort, that's what steadiness of mind is. And in order to be, have steadiness of mind, we can't be focused on what we like and what we don't like. It has to be this idea of just allowing things to be as they are, that we're not moving towards something that's because it's pleasant, and we're not moving away from something because it's unpleasant. We're just being still. And so steadiness of mind is really important. And so mindfulness has, the only way mindfulness works, or what I call the power, power of mindfulness, is when these other factors, like effort and and steadiness of mind, of faith and wisdom are working together and balancing each other. And so we can make the effort to be mindful. And so what is mindfulness? Um, so when we allow each moment to unfold as it is, there has to be this ability to have mindfulness, which is supported by right effort and, and steadiness of mind, and, and, and wisdom, it has to be working with wisdom. In other words, we have to have an idea, well, what are we doing? What are we being mindful for? And so Socrates said, wisdom begins in wonder. So there's this guy, his name is um, Eugene, what's his name, Eugene Fink. He says, wonder is the unwilled willingness to meet what is utterly strange and what is most familiar. It is the willingness to step back and let things speak to us a passive receptivity to let the things of the world present themselves in their own terms. And so our normal way of observing experience is uh, uh, data, something comes up, whether it's a thought or a sound or an image or a sensation, it comes up. And instead of just perceiving it as it is, there's a very short time in the perceptual process where we're seeing it as it is. We're letting it speak to us, but then immediately there's self-reference, there's associative thinking, there's uh, abstract thinking. And so we end up embellishing the raw data with our views of things. And so what mindfulness does, and one of the things I talk about in the book a lot is that what we want to do is we want to create space between stimulus and response so that we can actually allow the receptive phase of perception to be elongated or longer. And so these practices of mindfulness and and, and concentration and right effort, these things help us to create space between stimulus and response 
so that, as Viktor Frankl said, in, the, in that space we can create, we can actually stop, slow down, and see what's happening, let things speak to us instead of embellishing them with what we think. Because a lot of the time, even you listening to me now, I guarantee you, one of the things we do is we listen to what is being offered and we compare it to what we already know. So that's, that's interesting, but we haven't had an experience of everything, so we're not really present to what is and letting it speak to us. Well, why is that so? Because it takes a certain level of vulnerability to allow things to speak for themselves without us knowing what the answer is before, especially in this culture. We multitask, which is a myth. No such thing as multitasking. But we, we do it. We think we're doing it. The mind is just flitting from one thing to the other. But ultimately, the mind can only be with one thing at a time. And a part of this cultivation of mindfulness or being flow ready is the idea of allowing things to speak to us. And then in that speaking and in that space, we're able to discern and make proper choices. And part of that process is to make mistakes because we don't know what we don't know. But by learning and being able to observe experience in a certain way, we're able to learn from our mistakes. And then when we go into it again, we get a little bit more information. We start stitching intelligence together. The way I like to frame it, it's like when you do a crossword puzzle, or not a crossword, a jigsaw puzzle. That when you do a jigsaw puzzle, you know, you put one piece, you try pieces, and you put them aside. And then you're going along, and you say, oh, I need a piece. I saw that piece. You go get the piece, and you put it together. And then as you keep building on it, each time you go around it, circular learning, each time you go through it, through trial and error, you get a full picture of what is there. And then you get another puzzle. And then you start over again. So this is how we learn. We don't just see things or know things ahead of time. A lot of it is just blue collar uh, trial and error. And then the mindfulness helps us remember what's happening so that we can actually um, learn. So it's all about, it's a commitment to learning, learning for learning's sake, and doing things for the sake of the thing. Because when we do it for a gaining idea, then we, we get greed, and then the wrong effort is applied because we're trying too hard, or we're trying with an ulterior with a, with a motive that is coloring what's happening. Does that make any sense, what I'm saying? And so this idea of mindfulness and being in flow, being flow ready is just learning and being in the moment and let each moment unfold. And what happens is we start to get into the way things are and we're flowing with it. Then the next thing you know, we're actually seeing how things are evolving before they evolve because we, we developed this, this sixth sense. But I also talk about this idea of observing from the eye of the hurricane. Because by observing from the eye of the hurricane, there's this in the eye of the hurricane, there's blue skies, there's all this turmoil that's going around, but when we can be in the middle, we can observe things without reacting to them. So mindfulness is supported by these things, and one way of looking at mindfulness or uh, what mindfulness might look like or the flavor of mindfulness would be this idea of not forgetting. So everything, we can only live in the moment. So everything that's happening in this moment is all there is. And so our ability to not forget, not forget what? What we're doing. So it's like even being here. Well, why am I here? I'm here to listen, to learn. So got to remember that. And when you do that? In the moment. So we got to remember the moment, remember what our intention, what it is we're doing. And so that's one part of it. And that's where the steadiness of mind comes in, when we're not forgetting. And then there's presence of mind. Well, what's presence of mind? Mind being in the here and now. It's like mirror mind. It's just the mirror just reflects what's in front of it. And so that's where this ability to be still and know or just see how by being in this eye of the hurricane with this relaxed receptivity that can be, in, that can be some enthusiasm or, or uh, I won't say, a joy of learning or loving to learn or learning for learning's sake. So that we're sitting there and saying, well, what is this? We have this curiosity. We have this interest. We want to investigate, we want to see things, so that we're letting things speak to us in their own language, in their own time. Because a lot of us have time pressure, so we, won't, we, we need this to move along. We can't wait for it to unfold, but that's the only way we're going to know, is to have that ability to, to wait and let it speak to us. So an example I love to use is when we have, we're in conversation with each other all the time. And so what is it like when we're talking to somebody and they're not there? 
They're trying to formulate the answer before they even hear the question. I think we're all guilty of that on some level. Mm -hmm. So this, in that case, is like just being there and saying, okay, I wish you would hurry up. I, I, you know, I got things to do. You know, but just realizing that that's not being present. That mindfulness just sits there and just listens and let the whole thing be communicated or speak for itself. And then there's this, this ability to, to ascertain or to come from that space where we can have some wisdom and say, okay, I heard what is being said, and then trusting that if we listen and we're present, and we're being still and knowing, there's a wisdom that's there. There's an ability to be there. So not forgetting you know, the present moment and what it is we're doing, so the steadiness of mind, presence of mind, being in the moment, mirror mind, just letting things speak for themselves. And then there's this idea of remembering. Remembering what? Remembering what is skillful, what is helpful, what is not. So if I remember, okay, I got to be here and listen without trying to answer, and that I know when, when my mind is, has compassion there, there's a willingness to listen. When I have patience there, there's a willingness to listen. When there's, when there's impatience, or if there's some other negative emotion like indifference, I'm not really going to be there. And I need to know, this is right after, I need to know how to, how to Abandon that negative mind state, like uh, indifference. How do I know? Oh, there's indifference in the mind. Can I just let it go and then bring this quality of, of care and attention to what is being said? And so it's this idea of knowing what's skillful, what's unskillful. That's the right effort. And so then finally, it's also what's the essence of what's happening? So what's the essentials? Well, the essentials in the conversation are 70% listening and 30% speaking. So the essential is to listen, just to know that, OK, if I'm speaking before they're, they're speaking, then, then I don't know, I don't have the right information that tells me what I need to know. What are the essentials? The essentials is to be still and know, to be present, and to just listen. Each time the mind is thinking about something else, just come back and listening again. And so mindfulness looks like that. Mindfulness looks like you know when you come someplace or when you're doing your activity, the basic fundamental of what it is you're doing, that's in mind when, with the mindfulness. You know, okay, well, you got to know a little bit at least what I'm doing and, and why. So there has to be this, this understanding. So there's some mental preparation before to figure out what it is we're doing and why. And so, and we talk about this. So there's mindfulness or just the bare sensation of mindfulness, just knowing, like say for instance, if you're sitting and you're breathing and then there's a, let's say there's, there's a, some sensation in your knee, especially if you're sitting in a way and you have, and there's pain in the knee. I won't even call it pain, let's say there's a sensation. So instead of calling it pain, you just notice, okay, this is the bare sensation. So just noticing the bare sensation or if a sound comes in through, through the window or through the door, let's say. Where I practice in Cambridge is right on the main street. So you'll be sitting there meditating, and a fire engine goes by. And so our ability to be mindful and notice that we're sitting, and the sound comes through the window, or the sound comes into our awareness, well, we could allow it to be a sound, or we could make it noise. I say, oh, that's a fire engine. It shouldn't be there. I'm trying to meditate. And so we just notice, oh, we're hearing. But then if we see that we made it in the noise, then we can just say, OK, there's frustration. There's, I don't know what you want to call it, um, anger or fear that we're not going to be able to meditate because of sounds coming in. And we can just know, oh, there's fear in the mind or there's, oh, there's anger or just noticing, oh, it's just a sound. It's just a sound. Just see it as a sound. So something happens, a sound. Then we interpret what it means and what it is. And that's where we suffer. We suffer because we make it noise. And there's an ability to just notice and just let it flow through. Because the interesting thing is, it won't last more than 30 seconds. But if we keep it in mind and we hold on to it, it's still in the mind. Fire engine's still there. And so we start to understand that there's a way of relating to experience out of that eye of the hurricane where we're just allowing things to, to come because they arise and pass away. Under the right conditions, there's a sound that comes through. And that's only the external. Just imagine what's going on inside with the self-talk and our opinions about everything. 
When we start to sit still and notice, we got an opinion about everything. And there's no shame. We'll say any, we'll think about anything. But then we see it and say, oh, I can't, I'm a meditator. I can't have thoughts like that. I shouldn't be thinking at all. Well, good luck with that one. Because <laughs> there's all kinds of thoughts that are coming up. There's all kinds of sensations. What matters is our ability to just notice that thinking is happening, that sound is happening, that sensations are happening. So there's a way of relating to experience in a way where we can just be still and know and just lot, let things speak to us. We create space between stimulus and response. And when there's no space between stimulus and response, that's not a problem if we just notice, oh, OK, you know, my mindfulness wasn't quick enough. And then just start over again. And so this idea of, of cultivating this way of being, so you can do this from the time we go, wake up to the time we go to sleep. So there's the sitting meditation and being still and, and focusing. But then there's this idea of, like even now, just think about it. Humor me for a moment. Do you know you are sitting? Do you really know you are sitting right now? Are you conscious of sitting? So most people say, yeah, George, of course I know I'm sitting. Well, how does it feel? How can you prove that out? What are the parts of the body that are making contact with surfaces, and what does it feel like? Is it pressure? Can we be still? Can we just sit here and listen and then allow our body to be embodied and to have our body anchor us, anchor us in the present and notice that there's breathing going on, or it should be, and that we can just sit here and just notice a breath comes, a breath goes. We just breathe in, sitting, feeling. So when we stand up, be aware of standing up. You walked here from somewhere. Can you remember what happened between where you were and how you got here? And some of us will kind of remember, some of us may not, because we were trying to get here in a hurry. We didn't want to miss anything. And so the body is moving. Are we in the body as it's moving? Do we know when we move our hand, when we, when we do things? This, these are postures, mindfulness of postures, just knowing we're sitting down and knowing it, standing up and knowing it, listening and knowing it. That, that sounds simple, right? How often do we do it? Well, we're busy trying to hear what's happening and not being anchored in the body and noticing that there's a way of relating all day where we can just check in. Well, is there energy in the body? Is, you know, Am I, you know, am, you know how, how does it feel when I'm listening? Is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Is it neutral? What's my attitude? Am I happy to be here or am I just here and I don't know how I feel? That's okay, but knowing that is really important. Just knowing what our attitude is, knowing how we're seeing things. So there's so many things we could do, and I don't want to talk a lot more. I just wanted to just kind of introduce some of these concepts like this idea of of mindfulness, just not forgetting, presence of mind, remembering what is skillful, and then staying focused on that. And then what are the essentials? What is it we're doing? What are the basic fundamentals? I do this with, with whether we're speaking or hearing, or whether we're doing our job, or if you're playing basketball or softball, or even walking. Just being with ourselves as we're walking, moving through space, and we'll notice that that the body can't stay in one position too long. It's in either one or four positions. It's either walking, standing, sitting, or lying down. And that all through the day, we have those transitions. Are we aware of them when we do them? Do we know why the body is walking? Does it, do we know where it's going? Do we know what the purpose is to lie down? How many of us lie down at night and try to go to sleep and? Everything we did during the day, or all our worries are there. And we start ruminating, thinking, thinking, and then, uh, OK, it's been two hours. I'm still trying to sleep. <laughs> Instead of realizing that, yeah, OK, there's, we have to have a way of letting go of work, or letting go of or something keeps coming up. Either we need to attend to it, or we need to figure out how to let it go. But this happens. So we have this, it was that saying that most of us live in uh, quiet um, lives of desperation. I think a lot of us, especially people in this room that have been very uh, successful and skillful, um, there's a lot to be happy for, but there's always suffering in one form or the other. That's, that's, that's a human condition. Suffering is things change. They don't stay the same. We get connected with things we don't like. We get uh, removed from things we do like. You know, we could have a certain mindset. It's going to change. Not going to say so. 
things change all the time. There might be subtle things or parts of our lives like Sigmund Freud said, love, work, and play. If you got all three of those working, you're doing okay. If you can, you know, if, if you can work, love, and play at a high level, that's what he calls um, psychological health. Well, good luck with that one. Because <laughs> very rarely do we have all three going on really well, and it doesn't stay that way. Because we got parents that are getting old, getting sick, uh, we're getting old. Uh, things change. You know, we don't have the same level of energy we had before. Uh, then there's just things that happen. People we know die and get sick. Or, you know, the candidate we like doesn't get elected. Or he does get elected and doesn't do what we want him to do. There's all of these things that happen that have an impact on us. And so really it's about just starting to get in touch with what's going on in here, what's going on in the heart. And then starting to understand, well, how am I living? Who, who do I want to be? Because I like to say, if you don't know who you are, you could be anybody. And if you don't know where you're going, you could end up anywhere. So these are just some of the things that I'd like to open up the conversation about is just talking about, obviously, we can talk about anything, but just this idea of flow having to do, because flow is when, when we're in flow, it's interesting. Because our self-consciousness is gone. You hear people all the time, well, I don't know where I went. I wasn't there. I got expanded awareness. And time, everything was effortless. It was doing it by itself. Time flies. I don't know where the time went. The sense of time was altered. But the interesting thing is, to be in flow, we have to have a, in a, be in a high state of arousal, which means that our challenges and our skill level have to be high. And that an elite athlete or a mindful person knows when that high state of arousal, that excitation, could be because we're very excited because we're, something good is going to happen, or we could be very excited because something bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And our relationship to it is it, is it um, if we see it as a, as, as a crisis, or, or as a, not as a crisis, but as a curse, then we're probably going to reduce our energy or lower our standard. So just before we get to that, that flow state, we, we quit or we withdraw. But if we see it as an indication that we're really close to getting where we want to go, and we see it as a challenge, then we bring more energy, more focus into it. We persevere. We consistently continue to make the effort. Then we get into flow. But then even that's a problem because it won't last. <laughs> but while we're in it, we can be in it. And then when we get out of it, we say, oh, that was great. I'd like to do that again because, you know, all of a sudden I, I disappeared. Where did I go? <laughs> you know, what happened to time? You mean it was two hours? It didn't feel like that. And so this is the excitement, the mystery of, of life is that we can get into things and we can just take it one moment at a time and just really manage the moment that we might find ourselves getting into the, like the stream or the flow of a river. We end up getting into the current of it and we flow with it and it's taking us where we want to go without any effort. But if we try to do it consciously, it's a problem. But if we just do these things as a byproduct of paying attention, a byproduct of understanding how to be mindful moment to moment, because the secret is continuity of mindfulness, mm -hmm. not being mindful for two or three hours while we're sitting or, or doing what we love to do and we really focus on it. It's being present for our life more and more, mm -hmm. bringing more and more of that continuity. And sometimes just knowing that there's a body, just a continual mindfulness is fine. You don't have to have a whole lot of, it can be a rough, just okay, my body, I feel it. There's a body there, it's moving, it's sitting. It doesn't have to be where there's a body and it's doing such and such. Just to the extent that we know we have a body, it can be enough. Okay, yes. Hi, George. Thank you so much. As you're talking, I'm just getting more and more excited about asking my questions. And I have um, quite a few. And so I'm just going to ask one, and then I'll go from there. But as you're talking about flow and body, um, when I see that I haven't read your book, but I know who you are. I mean, I read a little bit about you. So I know you worked with Phil Jackson and the Bulls. And that was a time where I used to watch basketball all the time. So the fact that you're talking about this, and you worked with them, and they won so many championships, I would love for you to describe how you worked with them as a team and as individuals, and how they, when you're saying like you get into the flow, and then you accomplish your goal, and then you lose it, how did they get into a position where just about every time they went out on the court, 
they were in the flow mm -hmm. for so long? Yes, well, it's interesting because somebody asked me recently, because I'm working with the New York Knicks, and of course they had an interesting season last year, and people said, George, it must be really hard you working with them, you know, they're not this and that. And I said, no, my job is the same, no matter what, is just to help them to be more present and help them to try to, to manage the moment in a, in a skillful way. So when I was working with the Bulls and having Michael there, it was, it was very interesting because there was a commitment to excellence and there was a, they were always raising their challenges. And so you can even, if you were to listen to Michael, you hear him say, okay, he won three championships before I even got there. Then they won in 96. And then in 98, you can hear him saying, why, uh, 97, you can hear him say, well, let's win one for Coach Ham because we had a new coach. So he would always find a reason or a, a another worthy cause of what to commit to so that we could continue to be motivated and keep pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone. So the way you do that, whether you're in last place or first place, is wherever you are today is not where you want to be tomorrow. So there's this constant getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, pushing out of our comfort zone so that you're in a high state of arousal. So a lot of us, I, I tend to say that we spend most of our time in boredom or anxiety. So we're bored when we have high skills but low challenges. So we're chilling, we're in that relax, we're content. And then there's others who have low skills and high challenges and they're anxious, you know, they're just... And so the idea is, the middle way is when you're anxious because the challenges are too high, then you gotta get busy in improving your skills, knowledge, and experience. So then you're always, you know, you're always moving. So there's, there's no standing still. You're always trying to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday. And the important thing is working with them is to talk to them about competing against their previous best self, not the other team. Because on a given night, you might play a team that's better or worse. And you might beat them or win, but you haven't really gotten better that night. You haven't really competed at a level that is gonna push you out of your comfort zone and extend, expend your capacity to perform. Mm -hmm. And the same for us, not just athletes, even in our work, to the degree that we're able to just look and evaluate, well, where am I, where do I wanna go, and how do I keep pushing? And it's incrementally, and it's painless, because it doesn't have to be so far ahead that we're damaging ourselves just a little bit at a time, like slow motion gets you there quicker just incrementally, and then it, then it has an exponential jump when we can do that. So that was the idea, is having people who are willing and committed to excellence and willing to say, okay, let's keep raising our, our challenges and let's keep getting better each day. Let's put in the work, let's, let's use the mindfulness and, and, and stay committed to what the basic fundamentals are. And then you have a system that's predicated on on um, all five players moving like fingers on the hand in unison. So the we take precedent over the me, and it's a blending, it's a, it's a commitment. One of the things Phil used to say all the time, what he still says is, the strength of the pack is in a wolf, and the strength of the wolf is in a pack. Mm -hmm. So we need both the wolf and the pack, or both the individual player and the team. So as good as Michael was, as good as Scotty was, as good as Dennis was, they had to work together and they had to find a way of being in the we, but in the same time, in that context, could they be their unique, authentic selves in that, in that space? Hi, George. Uh, I really admire that you are taking the, um, the topic of mindfulness for athletes. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more about this. For example, I'm a wannabe triathlete. And you know, to run triathlons, you have to push yourself. You have to run harder in order to be able to perform mm -hmm. faster. And there is a lot of pain on the way, especially to run fast. Like there is a moment, like a lot of more, a lot of points of pain. So I'm wondering, like, can you use mindfulness in order to overcome those once you're in a training session, or maybe like can you use mindfulness in order to get more motivated to exercise? And I would appreciate like some practical uh, tips on like how to approach the athletics discipline with with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, let's think about mindfulness. What mindfulness? can do with, with those other factors, with wisdom um, and 
and making the right effort and having enough faith and steadiness of mind. It's really looking at, okay, so what am I doing and what's the best way to do it? Is what we would call clear comprehension, which is what's your purpose, what's your intention? Because your intention is really important. If your intention is just to do this because it's a good thing to do, that's a certain energy. If your intention is to do this because you want to see, you know, you love uh, comp competing and you love this, this context of swimming, riding a bike, and running. And so then you, you have to investigate, explore, well, who's the best at doing this? Who's the best swimmer in a triathlete? Who's the best runner? Who's the best um, cyclist? And then you try to learn and try to understand what are the basic techniques for each one of those things. And then your own personal evaluation or inventory of yourself. What do I do well? What do I not do well? So let's say if you're really good, what are you really good at? What's your best? The running. The running. Okay. So then the idea is you want to sustain the running, but if you're really weak at swimming and really weak at, at cycling, then maybe your strategy needs to be, this is what we call strategic planning or forethought. You know, it has to do with motivation, but also your strategy, your technique, your, your tactics that you're going to use. And so when we set goals, the goals can be a combination of outcome and technique. So you have to work on the technique that will help you get faster times and help you develop a, a place where you're, it's effortless. But if you try to do all three of those things with equal attention and care, um, that might not be the best use of your time. It may be that whatever you do really well, you sustain that and then maybe one of the other two, instead of trying to do both of those, you just focus on one and get that one up to speed or get that one faster. And then just realize, okay, that one I'm not so good in, so my time's not gonna be good, but I'm gonna focus on what I can control and what I can get better at. Because what you don't wanna do sometimes is do something you're really not good at and spend all your time just to be mediocre rather than realizing just do it to a certain level to the best you can, but then focus on the areas where you can get gain time or you can reduce time. You get what I'm saying? And so it's more like that. So there has to be some wisdom, some understanding on what's the best way for me to imp improve my performance. And whatever, and instead of trying to perform, do it all at once, you start selectively selecting what things you want to bring more deliberate practice to and really focus on getting better at so that even though you have uh, less, uh, more time in one of those three components, the other two can carry that one. So it's like they have a thing they call Pareto analysis. I used to work in the corporate world as a financial analyst. And the Pareto analysis says that if you have five things, instead of working on all five, if you take two of them or you take one of them, that one thing, that 20% will give you 80% of the benefit. So you start to deliberately understand, well, which one is going to enhance my improvement, the mo uh, my performance the most, then you focus on that. Make sense? Oh, yeah, it does. Okay, and obviously, not that I'm trying to sell it, but my book is a good start for this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it actually, because you start looking at, because this the five spiritual powers, you have to have energy to do whatever you're going to do, and these balancing of those powers actually helps you have, have access to energy and power to do things, especially the space between stimulus and response, because when you start paying attention, you'll start to know. Because when I, I used to run before my legs came out, and what I used to get a stitch running, and then when I became mindful, I just, instead of calling it a stitch, I could just be with it, allow it to be there, and, and I was able to run longer and just allow it to just to be a sensation, just allow it to be there and just continue to, because the more you try not to have it, the more you have it. You get what I'm saying? So the mindfulness can be really helpful because the body has intelligence if we can just listen to what it's telling us. So sometimes when it tells us to rest, we have to get recovery. Sometimes it tells us if we can push it a little bit long, more. But you got to listen and you got to know your body and what you need to do. So you mentioned something about um, knowing who you are and where you are, what you want to do. So do you believe like everyone needs a life purpose and also life mission to achieve. Uh, do you think that's the whole point of being present, uh, being mindful? Yeah, is, is the purpose just to be who you are? Um, maybe I'll answer it this way. One way I, I look at this is that we all have a masterpiece inside and we all have a uniqueness that 
is special and that if we can cultivate that, embrace it, develop it, and share it with others, that that would be really, really helpful. But I do know this, if we don't know who we are, we, we will end up being anybody. And if we don't know where we're going, we'll end up going anywhere. So the idea is that we have the ability to, to decide what our core values are or how we want to live. And even if we don't know who we are, if we just live according to core values, you know, you know like just being more loving, more compassionate, uh, being present for yourself and others, that you start to glean. And then when you listen, there'll be something inside of you that starts speaking to you from your heart, telling you, you know, okay, I like to do this. Like Joseph Campbell said, follow your bless. Where's your bless? But the problem with that sometimes, or the difficulty of that sometimes is if we really look at where we are and who we want to be, we might not be in the place we're at and we, not, we may not be with the people we're, we're with. So there's, there's, there's a loss there, some, or there's a having to let go, which can be painful. But to my experience, myself, I had to be in the throes of substance abuse before I got to a point where I said, okay, this is not working. Well, maybe I ought to look and see who I'm supposed to be and just connect with that, follow my bliss, and just be the best George I can based on an inside-out approach, not what somebody thinks I should be or what society says I should be, but really looking inside and then following my bliss or following the thing that wants me, uh, you know, that draws me to it. It's heartfelt. As you know, a path, a path with heart is, as Jack Cornfield would say, mm -hmm. just following, you know, what is it? And sometimes it's a being still and knowing and asking that question, you know, who am I or who do I want to be or who do I admire? Or what are the qualities that I admire in, in people and that I would like to emulate? So I'm experiencing, I think, what might be a paradox, but I'm struggling with it. I'd love to hear how you communicate, maybe specifically to athletes uh, for an analogy. I find that the more I cultivate a mindfulness and meditation practice in my own life, the better I'm getting with productivity, focus, compassion. So it's becoming harder and harder for me during those practices to be still and present and really in the moment because I realize the benefit from them. So I, I find myself wanting to cultivate those practices for this outcome that I'm wedded to. And which is, it's, it's paradoxical because, you know, I want to be in this, this moment and this moment not thinking about what's to come. Mm -hmm. um, but the more I do it, the more I get better at these things. And so it's making it harder to be in the moment. Does this make any sense? Yeah. So what you're <laughs> saying is you can't be in the moment and think about the future at the same time? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But who said you had to be in the moment all the time and never think about the future? That's a good one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> See, because the, the fact is, what I think is helpful is forming the intention or saying this is, okay, there's a mountaintop and I want to go there. So every once in a while I look at the mountaintop, but the main thing is to be on the journey and be present to the journey because the journey could have twists and turns or we could get off track, but the mindfulness will bring us back on track. And so this either or, or saying I got to totally always be present and not think about the future or not have an idea of where I want to go. Uh, that, that is a way of looking at it. That's not the only way to look at it. I think that it's important that you have goals. It's important that you are striving. But after you set the intention, form the intention, and set the goal, then you've got to focus on the here and now and the incremental steps to get you there. So you've got to keep looking, am I going in the right direction? Is this what, where I need to be? Because you can get off track. And so I don't see it as a paradox at all unless you start using the present time to think about the future more than being in the present time as you are experiencing the present time. So you got to find a balance there and each person's going to be different. But sometimes just thinking about, you know, your goal can be inspiring and motivating. But then where it gets to be a problem sometimes is you have an idea of how it should unfold instead of just forming the intention and allowing it to unfold the way it needs to. Hi, George. Thank you for sharing your insight with us. Um, when I run, especially on longer runs, um, I find it easier, a lot easier if I let my mind tune out and just drift away and, you know, wander around, as opposed to being uh, mindful of running. Somehow time 
goes faster than when I'm not thinking of running, which is kind of like the total opposite. You know, you're advising us. Um, I'm wondering if I misunderstood what you're saying or if this is. Yeah, so are you enjoying what you're doing? Yes, I do a lot. Uh, and are you aware of what you're doing? You're aware that your mind is just kind of out there, not focused on anything in particular? Yeah, and sometimes I purposely take it there. <laughs> okay, yeah, but it would be interesting to see, because I don't see anything wrong in what you're doing unless you're taking it there because you don't want to be in your body because there's something in there you don't want to deal with. Because one of the things we do, the nervous system is programmed to do is, if it's pleasant, it will move towards it. If it's unpleasant, it will move away from it. And if it doesn't have a goal or a focus, then it will space out. It's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And I say we spend most of our time in that one, that you just space out, whether we're watching TV or running and just letting our mind just go. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. Just knowing that you're doing that is important. Just knowing where your mind is, even if it gets lost for 20 minutes and it comes back. When you're back, you're back. Right, it usually goes out you know, for, for a few minutes, comes back, and then goes out again and comes back. And especially when you're running two, three hours. then. You know. Yeah, well, well, I think everybody's mind's like that. That whatever we're doing, we're, we're not able, because we'd be enlightened if we could be present <laughs> and we didn't have any issues, uh, we'd be enlightened. But the mind has a mind of its own. It, it goes and does things. And it's when it's going off and doing that, when we're, I say you're doing carpentry at home, and you got the the... the the electric saw going, I think your mind wants to be present. <laughs> or when you're driving, or when you're doing things, there's a time, like the carpenter say, measure twice, cut once. There's a reason why they say measure twice, because the first time, you may not have been paying attention. Because <laughs> the mind has a mind of its own. It, it's always going off. So I'm not suggesting when you're mindful means your mind is always there. I'm saying when you're mindful, you're mindful when your mind is not there. You're mindful when you do space out. Now, it's not a problem unless you make it a problem and say, it shouldn't be doing that. Well, it's doing it because that's what it does under those conditions. So if you don't like that, then you've got to change the conditions. Right. But if you're okay with it, it's fine. But I'm not, it's not to use the mindfulness and say mindfulness means you're there and you're not thinking about anything else. No, mindfulness is, is kind of a, it could be a broad mindfulness. It could be really narrow when you're focusing on one thing. But most of the time, being broad is good because it shows you how things are connected, and you see the whole periphery of all the activity and the interconnectedness of everything. So it's, it's a question of what do you mean by mindfulness and why are you running? It's always your intention. If your intention is just to run and to be out there and just to let your mind go, then that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But if your intention is to be there and to, and to be mindful and then really you know, improve your performance, that's something else. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I was just confused a little bit, George, about when you're talking about slowing everything down and elongating everything, and yet you're talking, you know, the sport that you've been involved in, you know, primarily is basketball, mm -hmm. which happens in split seconds. That's right. And being, having to be incredibly attuned and present. I mean, it's a contradiction to me, I guess. I, when I, when, yeah, when I, it sounds like a contradiction. I was watching this program. Uh, it was on uh, the human, I think it was on sight or the brain, and it was about these, these firefighters that were in the Northwest fighting a fire. And one of the things the brain can do is, so they were in this place and all of a sudden they got trapped by the uh, fire, surrounded them. And so the brain has this trick where it can slow down perception where these folks were able to slow, it slows down your perception so that things seem, uh, uh, they slow down. There's a way of relaying experience where you come out of that space. You just have like two seconds seems like an eternity. And it's like relativity. So, like, so if, you, if your team is up by one point and it's two seconds to go and, you're, and the other team has the ball, that's a long two seconds. But if you're, if, if it's, you're the team that is trying to score, that two seconds is not enough time. But so perception is really interesting. So there's a way of relating to your experience and then by programming yourself when you're not on the court by slowing down and understanding. And a lot of times the slowing down is not to habitually react, but just to let things speak to you. And in that space, the perception, it, it creates more, more time. And so it's not like you're doing it on purpose. It happens because you are open and not 
mechanically reacting to things. You are actually letting things speak to you. And so it's something that I talk about, but unless you experience it, may not make sense. But I'm pretty sure there's times when, um, depending on, it's not just sports, but when you're looking at something and for some reason there's enough patience there and a willingness to just hang out and that not knowing. If that makes any sense, it's just just not knowing. And so you cultivate that by being mindful and because you kind of know what's going to happen and you program your autonomic, you program your neural net to know what to do. And so, you know, and they say that the speed of trust, like if you trust things and you have, a, and you know things are going to turn out well, you've got a lot of patience. You know, it's a perception of, it's, you know, it's relative. So this idea that, you know, we have the same perception and, and, and everything's the same speed, but the body and the mind, when you say, okay, save me, the intention is to save you, the, the unconscious has a way of slowing perception down so that we have time to do what we have to do. And these guys, you know, it was just a, a instinct, a survival instinct. These firefighters were able to save their lives because they were able to slow down time and they get to where they need to get and to dig and then to put the things over themselves so that they can do that. And a lot of times you, you see it, it's just, um, in a book I talk about when I was a, when I was, um, a substance abuser, you know, using heroin. And one time I was, uh, you know, giving myself an injection and the needle broke and it started moving in my vein. And I slowed down time, I tied up my arm and I was able to go to the emergency room and they were able to catch it because if that had gone to my heart, I would have died. So it slowed down time and I was, I was not in my right mind, but, but my brain knew what to do. So it's not just because my mindfulness allows us to do that. There's a, there's, a, there's a life instinct. There's a way that the nervous system, when we get out of the way, it knows what to do. And so I, I cited this situation. So yeah, it's not a paradox that you're moving really fast, but because you're coming from the eye of the hurricane, my Sifu, my Tai Chi teacher said, there's movement and stillness and stillness and movement. So you can be quick and not be in a hurry. And that's what John Wooden, that was his famous saying, the, the Hall of Fame coach for UCLA. He said, be quick, but don't be in a hurry. And so there's a way of relating the experience where there's just time. Just like people would tell you when they're in a the zone, that basket is huge or that goal is huge and you can't like, describe it. So it being huge, huge, it, it, there's something about it. You know, and, and some people, Pele, he had this thing he would do where he would, where he would move his body one way and the goalie starts moving this way and then he would, boom, he would do this thing. They have a name for it. But he had this ability unconsciously to reverse directions before the other person knew what was going to happen. And, and if they do an fMRI on you, they can tell you what decision you're going to make before you're aware of it because it, 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 hmm. there's part of the brain that trigger or the neural net that, that, that signals or that, stimu that stimulate it, that it fires before we're aware of it. So there's this, place, this time before stimulus and response. And so most of the time, because it's reactive and we're not paying attention, there's no time. But when we're paying attention and we can see it as it's arising, then we can create space and be able to have a have a thing. So it's not some of this stuff. If you're trying to figure it out with the left brain, if you're right-handed, it ain't going to get there. It's something you have to experience. It's like implicit learning is what we call it, a non-declarative. It's just something because they've done this with these tests with cards. People can you know they can pick cards, two decks of cards, and your unconscious knows what cards to pick, and it works better when your conscious mind is not involved. So when you know and you program yourself, you have time because it's reaction. It's like if there's a seeing, there's no space between seeing and react. And because the seeing is moving, you see this in baseball or any sports, the, the ball is hit and the guy is moving this way towards the ball. He's not thinking about it. His body has just he's been trained, that well trained to do that. So there's, no, there's, there's plenty of time because there's something that's moving that's already got what's happening and it's already prepared and ready to respond to what's happening.
I know it may not make sense, but that's the way it is. We're going to okay. leave it there, Thank George. You. Absolutely lovely to hear from you. Stick around if you want to ask him more questions or have him sign your book. And if you haven't read it, I recommend it. Thank you. Thank you.